Thank you. You'll notice that he doesn't even take his laptop away, right? You know, he, he, he makes me unplug mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Can't get the organising of, of these events. Sorry, You're two years out of practice, right? Yeah, his laptop didn't work last time, so, so let, let's find him to fix that. Hey, it's alive, alive, I tell you. And it's even on the right screen, result. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, Zachary. Um, I cannot tell you how nice it is to be here. Um, IglooConf was the last event that I did before the pandemic lockdown. And it's so nice that it's also the first one I'm doing after we're all allowed out to play again. So for the next 60 minutes or so, um, I'm going to tell you a story about a real project and a real product and um, the work that we did, have been doing, are doing, to move it from on-prem to the cloud. Uh, as Zachary said, um, I am another Microsoft Regional Director. In fact, I think we've got four here. So, yay. Um, I'm also an MVP. I've been an MVP for quite a while for Azure. But I actually have a day job, and my day job is um, I'm Chief Consulting Officer at a, a, a company in the UK called Black Mobile. So let's look at what we're going to talk about today. So I'm, I'm going to try and talk to you about what it is we're lifting and, and lifting and shifting and moving to the cloud, um, what the application is, what the customer wanted, what was driving the migration, how we thought we were going to do it, um, how we experimented and started to do it, and then what we actually did, and, and you know, sort of how far we've got, what the problems were, um, and hopefully try and give you some advice, you know, don't do that, it hurt, do that, it went really well. So I've basically split this presentation up into Rick's five stages of grief. Sorry, um, migration, anger, bargaining. And I, I talk to customers all the time, and I recommend they take a, a similar kind of approach because we've, we've done it and we've proved that this works. So we're going to start with evaluation, looking at what you've got, understanding how it works on-premises in your current environment so you know enough about it to move it, but also enough about it to be able to compare what you're building to what you've got, make sure it works, make sure it's running correctly. Then we're going to talk about translation, putting what you've got in the cloud unchanged as part of the sort of testing and development progress, progress, process even. Um, not just lift it and shift it and now it's going to work in the cloud um, on virtual machines. Friends don't let friends do IS. Once we've got it in the cloud though, that enables experimentation. Changing bits of it, see what happens. What if we put this on app services instead of a Windows server? What if we change our data backend? All of that kind of stuff. Modification, the actual process of doing the work to start swapping components out, upgrading, updating so we can run effectively in the cloud. And then finally, operation, where we've actually got to move this to be a running, living, breathing product that our customers are using. So let's start with evaluation. Um, shockingly, this is the bit that everybody thinks, ah, yeah, we know our product. But actually, nine times out of 10, they don't. And there's this uh, overconfidence, he said, trying to pick a polite term. You think you know it, right? It's your favorite child. You built this application. It's been running, in our case, for seven years. And you've been operating it. You've been supporting the customer. You think you've got a really good understanding of how it works and, and how it scales. And I'll tell you now, you probably don't. And you need to find out. So let's, let's start with how we're going to do that. So the application that we've got um, is driven for the users via a mobile client. So they're, they're using a UWP app, they're using a, an Android app. That application is secure, so we talk to ADFS to get an authentication token. 
Once we're signed in, we have a client API that the um, users are talking to. And then that client API is supported by a set of core services. Yes, I am the only person on the planet still using Service Bus for Windows Server. No, I did not ever manage to get Dan to give me an upgraded version of it. So unfortunately, that one's dead. I'm also the only person on the planet probably still using Redis for Windows. That's also dead. You're spotting a pattern here, right? Um, our database backend is SQL. Um, but we're also using file stream. We put binary files into this thing. So um, we've got a, a huge um, sort of data store with, with, with binary files there, as well as what actually turns out to be not a huge amount of data in the SQL DB itself. Service bus is there because the, the client API is generating work. It drops messages onto service bus. Those messages are consumed by a portfolio of Windows services. So they pick up a message from Service Bus, they go and get data from the database, they go and um, talk to Redis, they stick more messages on the Service Bus. And then behind them, we've got some internal APIs. So those services can make calls to a suite of internal APIs to send data to and from other systems, for example. Um, imports and exports, that kind of stuff. Which means, because we've got external systems involved in this, we have to talk to those external systems. Now, enter stage left biz talk, that well-known, easy to move to the cloud product. Um, the living, beating, thrumming heart of all of this, which is talking to all of our customers' external systems. And just to be a bit of a pain, those external systems, they're all on a secure network. We can only access them over a secure network. And then finally, we've got SQL reporting services because we generate PDFs from this thing, which is another product that has no immediate cloud analog. But when we started this project seven years ago or so, the customer said to us, we're not ready for cloud yet, but we will be. So we want you to think about that when you build the product. And I remember standing on stage at other events, telling people that this was a great way of doing it. Hey, you know, think about your app architecture. Think from the get-go how you might put it in the cloud, because it's going to make your life a lot easier. So part of this presentation, if you like, is marking our homework on how well we did. So we knew that we would probably end up in app services, right? So our website has always been built and packaged and deployed using web deploy. And I'm a DevOps guy, so I talk about things like parameters XML and applying config as part of the pipeline. The Windows services, when we built them, we decided we'd package them as a, as a zip because that was the easiest way of getting onto the customer's systems, but also because a zip file means we can throw it into app services. And the team deliberately wrote those services so they can run through service host as a Windows service, but also run as a console app. And a console app will run as a web job in app services. So we thought about this. It's like, okay, we've, we, there's our, our, our basic scaffolding is the website goes in app services as a website, and the services go in as web jobs. Job done, tick, right, there you go, cloud migration, yay. Our, our SQL databases, we do data projects. So we're building DAC packs. So our schema management, our, our database deployment is robust. And as you all know, a DAC pack can deploy into SQL Azure as well. Authentication, we used the ADAR libraries when we started, which supported both ADFS and Azure AD. So we just repoint, easy peasy. And we chose Service Bus for Windows Server because we knew that Service Bus was also in Azure. Um, we didn't know that they would immediately discontinue it, so that's been entertaining. Um, and again, Redis, if you want a cache, you normally pick Redis, right? We thought this is a good choice, it's going to have a long life. We didn't know that Microsoft would discontinue the Redis on Windows. Bless them. So our expected migration, if you like, has a, where are we now? Where do we think we're going to with, with, with that initial migration? And where do we want to go in the future um, as part of that sort of longer term project, if you like? So like I said, APIs, We'll start 
we'll put them into IIS. Largely unchanged, okay? But what we'll then do is we'll front them with APIM because that's going to allow us to version those APIs and then crack them apart. And a lot of them, we can hopefully move the code and run it in Azure Functions. The services will start with web jobs. But again, we know we want to get rid of those web jobs. We want to, to move most of these to run on demand. So the plan is we'll translate those to Azure Functions. Redis, well, that's easy. We're going to use Azure Redis. We thought long and hard at this. We, we looked at the competition. It said Redis. We picked Redis. This one, however, this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, SQL file stream does not exist in any of the cloud versions of SQL. Not in Azure SQL, not in Elastic Pools, not in managed instances. So we're going to have to start with a VM. But we want to run on SQL Azure. There's only one database using file stream. So the hope is that we should be able to move most of the workload fairly easily and we will change the way the software works to get rid of file stream. And BizTalk. Oh, BizTalk. BizTalk will be a virtual machine for the shortest possible time because, by crikey, that's expensive to run. <laughs> um, so the immediate work will start to try and break that apart and we'll shift to using logic apps and functions. And then finally, reporting services. Well, actually, we want to get rid of that entirely. It generates PDFs. We've got other functionality in the product that generates Word docs. So we just want to replace that and we'll move that into Azure Functions as well. So we've got a plan, right? We know where we are. We know where we're going. ADFS, we hope, will be straightforward. To begin with, we're going to stick to ADFS because the customer is still using its on-prem AD. We're authenticating users with that. But we will transition to Azure AD because they're now a big Office 365 user. So as part of this, we've identified some constraints, which I've been talking about as I've been going. And we know we're going to have to deal with those. But the biggest constraint often isn't necessarily us or the technology, it's the customer. Now, they're a great customer, but they can blow a bit hot and cold on this. You know, I mean, we started off, they wanted to be in the cloud really quickly. That was seven years ago. This migration was being driven by a hardware refresh. So everything's end of life. We're running on Server 2012 R2 at the moment. Uh, we're running on SQL 2012, BizTalk 2013. All of these things need ratcheting forward. So there's a big push there. And the customers now really enthusiastically adopted Office 365 and is really starting to look at the whole SaaS offering. But this isn't just operated by us. It's operated by the customer teams. There's a bit of an anchor there because their internal teams don't have a great deal of cloud expertise. So we're going to have to bring them on the journey with us. They have security concerns and constraints. I, I mentioned that we can only talk to these external systems over their network. Um, they're worried about how we're going to put stuff in the cloud, how we're going to secure things. And timescales might be fun because we've got a hardware refresh coming. So we need to be able to put stuff in the cloud quite quickly if we're going to make this work. Otherwise, we're back on prem again. So. Remember at the start, I said evaluation, you need to know and understand how your product works and what it does. And when you build these things, you put logging in, right? What you don't necessarily put in is telemetry. And there is a difference. Logging tells me what happened in that beautiful way that you developers do. It's like reading a story. An error occurred, and this happened at this time with all of this information. And there's like 14 paragraphs of information in there. And it's brilliant, but it doesn't actually really tell me anything meaningful about what's happening when that error occurred. How much memory are we using? How much CPU are we using? All of that is telemetry. Now, we didn't have telemetry in this product when we, we built it. We've got logging. We're using NLog. 
But if we're going to move it to the cloud, we need to be able to look at what's running and work out how much memory it uses and look at how many requests we're getting in because we've got to right size the cloud services, right? So the first thing we did and the first thing you should do is we plugged in App Insights. And that is a remarkably easy process. Three stages. The first is we just installed the App Insights agent on all of our servers. And the second we did that, it plugged into IIS and out of my website site came all this beautiful telemetry. I was getting performance metrics on how much memory the server was using, on how much memory my website was using, how much CPU it was using, how many requests a second are coming in, what those requests are, whether they work, whether they fail, what the dependencies are, because it could see my calls to SQL. With a single line config change, now I could see the SQL queries that were going out. Brilliant. Stage two was we plugged our existing logging into App Insights. Not because I wanted to continue using logging, but we discovered really quickly that we got all this rich data about what's happening in App Insights, and all of the logging is in a SQL database. So they're not in the same place. So we wired nlog into App Insights, which was a really quick process. We create a telemetry provider inside our code and um, follow a couple of really nice readmes that Microsoft have got, and immediately we get a new output channel for nlog, which squirts all of that logging into App Insights. And we went, yay, and turned all of the logging up to its highest level, and then went, oh, crap, how much data, how expensive? Let's turn that back down again. Um, <laughs> but, it allowed me to do certain things. It allowed me to look at our old logging error messages and then grab the telemetry from the same point in time and start asking and answering questions. And that proved so useful that we actually started to add this into the code. So we started the telemetry journey a couple of years ago, perhaps even more to be fair. Now we've actually put custom events and importantly custom dependencies in. Custom dependencies have been the single most useful thing, I think, that we put in. And we get that wonderful app map there. So all those external systems that we talk to are now defined as dependencies. So I can see how many calls I make and what the failure rate is. Because some of these systems that we talk to are quite old. I need to know what normal looks like, because if I don't know what normal is, how do I know whether my cloud application is working? And we get to be able to run really cool custo queries where all of this stuff is, is in there. We found a memory leak with this stuff um, where I started doing crazy scatter plots where I'd got my, my server memory plotted against what requests were coming in and the y-axis was, was how long the requests took. So I could see which requests were coming in as the memory usage was climbing, which allowed us to then dig in and, and say, right, okay, we think it's that request. Let's now look at the, the request itself and we can see the dependencies and we can see where we're suddenly taking a long time and then we could look at code. That kind of diagnostics is impossible if you've just got logging. So now we've got a good idea of what we've got and how it runs. Now we need to think about how we get it into the cloud. Now we've got a plan. Okay, so we, we could go dark, change all the code, update everything, and then put it in Azure and see whether it works. And that's okay, but it's an approach that personally I hate. Um, because you don't get to see how the product operates in the cloud unchanged to begin with. Again, if we don't know what normal looks like, how do we know whether we're making a difference and doing things right or not? So the first thing I always say is let's get it into the cloud unchanged. And this allows you to build some things that are going to be useful moving forwards. So we build infrastructure as code to deploy things. We have to tackle a bunch of technical challenges to get this thing running in the cloud, but the solutions to those will help us in the long term. We're going to have to look at things like virtual networks. We're going to have to look at how we deal with service bus, because that's actually got to be swapped out completely. Um, 
So this also allows us to bring the customer on the journey because we can show them that the skills that they've currently got will translate to the cloud because they can see us doing this with things they know and understand because we're going to start with virtual machines and we're going to start with virtual networks and then we're going to evolve. So we start with this. It's a virtual network. It's a secure bubble. I know I need to present services to the outside world, so immediately I am going to have to start adding in Azure services just to publish this out unchanged. So we add front door and WAF. Because we're in a bubble, private link and private endpoints enter stage left, so I can connect into that bubble. I know that Service Bus is dead, so I'm not even going to try putting that on VMs in Azure. We're going to connect Azure Service Bus. But because of the security requirement, I immediately need to use Service Bus Premium and plug it in with a private endpoint. Exactly the same with Redis. And that involves a bit of scaffolding coming along for the, the, the ride as well with some private DNS zones to make it all work. And we built all of that with Bicep, or ARM templates, so we could deploy. And it was great. So the good news is, you know it, you understand it, you love it, you can do it really quickly, right? To build all of that, which is it's quite a big diagram, right? That took me a day. I built all the bicep in a day. I spent another couple of days doing a bit of debugging, a bit of tweaking, but it was an incredibly quick process. But it also exposed some of the pain we were gonna hit because front door's great, but there's a lot of layers between it and my application. Debugging that is a right pain, as it turns out. So we learned a lot in the process about looking at Azure's own telemetry. So in addition to our app insights, we realized that we need to plug all the diagnostics from the services we're now looking at using into the same app insights, the same log analytics. So we get all of that telemetry along for the ride, and then we can start to look. So I can see the inbound request to front door, and I can see whether it's being accepted or rejected by the WAF. So one of the biggest problems I had, we use SignalR. It turns out that the way we do our request headers on the SignalR requests to the WAF in front door looks a lot like a SQL injection attack. It's a device ID, for God's sake. How does it look like a SQL injection attack? But because I'd got the telemetry from front door, I could do a search, and I could see all the requests, and I could filter by the ones that were blocked, and I could see the rule that was being matched, and I could go and read the rule, and we could make changes to our code so we no longer got blocked. It is really important though, all that knowledge you've got about how you run your application, you've got to bring it along. You're now configuring VMs in Azure. You need to know and understand how you configure and run those VMs on-prem so you can make sure that everything matches. So hopefully you've already got config as code, right? Because we all do this properly on-prem, yeah? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we can just bring that config as, as code across. We do, for our black marble internal dev environments, all of this is, is configured using uh, desired state config, but our customer didn't use that. So interestingly, I deliberately didn't use config as code for this environment because I wanted to build it how they build it and follow their instructions. Again, so I'm comparing like for like. Now we've got this in the cloud, now we can go on to the the cool and fun and interesting bit, experimentation. <laughs> um, slight tangent, did a bunch of work for a big engineering company in the UK. It was a DevOps engagement. And it taught me a lot. And one of the things it taught me was that giving developers the freedom to experiment and making it easy to do will really help if you are trying to modify and improve a product. So we pretty much followed the same, the same plan with, with them. We built some infrastructure as code so they could deploy VMs to the cloud for this really big mission critical system. But once they'd got the ARM templates to do that, 
they'd create a branch in the code and go, what happens if we just stick a website in here, an Azure website instead, and just deploy things using the same pipeline? Does it work? Oh, it does. Oh, right, OK. Now can we modify the code with that? And they would do um, like sort of hackathon-driven spike projects where they just would pick a component of that product and just see what they could do. And because we'd built all that automation, because we built all of that infrastructure as code, it was easy for them to modify discrete parts of the app, chuck it into the cloud, and see what happened. And they got a really quick pace of change going by doing that. And they migrated the app to be running on Azure Pass services pretty quickly. Um, like I say, I learned a lot and I watched and went, that's a great idea. You know what? I'm going to take that idea and I'm going to tell everybody else it was my idea. <laughs> so, we are going to make sure that we have a repeatable, reliable process to build that bubble and then we're going to tinker with it. And because we've taken the time to instrument everything, what we do when we tinker will be meaningful and we'll be able to see how it works. And we'll combine that with the automated tests that we already have for the product and we'll use those to poke and prod and play with it in a managed, repeatable way to see what happens as we change things. Brilliant, right? So we end up with this. I modified the bicep. I stuck in app services, which immediately failed to work. So um, doing this showed us a few things. Showed us that we write to areas of the file system that it turns out we need to sort permissions out on. Um, showed us that authentication is fine user to system, but we've got service to service authentication that maybe we hadn't really thought about so much. Um, so, over a bit of time, I was working in a branch of the code I was trying to deploy. I tried to deploy my SQL databases. When they failed, I started hacking around with the DAC packs. Just, to see what I would need to do and what I would lose to get things to deploy. And we answered our fundamental questions. Can we deploy to Azure SQL? No. So the plan was great. Seven years ago, we said, right, we'll use DAC packs, because I can take the same DAC pack and I can deploy it to Azure SQL. And you could seven years ago. You can't anymore. SQL Server is a completely different deployment target in your data project. So you have to switch. You can't just move the same artifacts around like we hoped. Ironically, if I wanted to use managed instances with the latest versions of the, the data projects, there is now a SQL Server and SQL Managed Instance, and that is translatable. But that's not really where I want to land. So we are going to have to branch the code, and do some work on changing the DAC packs. We know that file stream is going to be a problem. Um, I had high hopes. You know when you get excited? I read the other day, ooh, SQL Server 2022 will use Azure AD for authentication. Huh, OK, that's interesting. Maybe I can sort of plug this in somehow. Maybe this will help me with, with how I'm going to sort out file stream. Because when I put app services in, I changed the connection strings. That's all I had to do to make app services talk to my SQL DB. Change the connection strings, and I have a local user on my SQL DB, and I can talk to it. Brilliant. So I tried an experiment where I put the SQL server in with no domain controller, just around my SQL accounts. Turns out Filestream doesn't work if you just use SQL auth. Didn't know that. Um, so I thought, ah. Maybe I can use Azure AD and use Azure AD accounts. No, that doesn't work either. So um, You read the documentation, you get excited, and then you try it, and it doesn't always work. But that's what the experimentation is for, right? And the other thing that we realized is our DAC packs create SQL agent jobs. There is no SQL, SQL agent in Azure SQL. 
We could, yes, we could use managed instances. That has SQL agents. But actually, when we look at what those jobs are, because we did, um, they're the kind of things that we can replace with time and triggered functions, that kind of stuff. So question number two, then. Does the API work in app services? <clears throat> so, so nearly. Um, two things tripped us up. One, so when we upload binary files to the, to the system from the client, the website drops them onto disk first. That's fine, thinks Rick. I'll just tell it a path on app services, and it'll put them on app services. And it didn't. It completely failed to write to app services, no matter what path I told it to, no matter where I put the folder. So that's why on that diagram a moment ago, Azure Storage enters the picture, because I created an Azure file share, and I had to map the Azure file share onto app services so it had a path that it could write to. I've already mentioned in the SQL slide, uh, we discovered that we had to use SQL authentication for talking to the DBs. We kind of expected that. But then we discovered if we're using SQL to talk to the DBs, we can't make file stream work. So, sort of 70% of the user functionality actually worked with virtually no changes, you know, and maybe an hour or two of, of me tinkering. But there's still dev work to be done. And then the mighty web jobs. Ah, so this one, I've spent many, many years going, hey, we've got this one absolutely in the bag, chaps. We know that these services will run because I can just double click them, right, in, in Windows Explorer and it fires up as a console app. I can, in a command prompt or a PowerShell, I can type the command and it fires up as a console app. This one is going to be easy. So I took the zip file, I uploaded it using kudu, I told it to start. And it went, computer says no. It started, it stopped, it started, it stopped, it started, it stopped, it's not working. As it turns out, I employ clever people. As it turns out, they're too damned clever. The reason things didn't work is because the very first thing the service did was query the .NET environment. And it said, am I user interactive? And if the .NET environment said, yes, you are, we started as a console app. And Windows answers yes to the question, am I user interactive, if you double click something in Windows Explorer or if you run it in a console. The thing that's hosting our web jobs just says, no, you're not user interactive. Which means we go, ha ha, we're a Windows service, and fail. If we just put a command switch on the thing, I could have done service.exe slash console mode and it would have been fine, but no, we had to be clever. As it turns out, that is a really quick and easy change to make. And once we've made that change, everything works. And all of our services fire into life. They talk to service bus with a connection string. We know we can talk to SQL because we can talk with a connection string. And that was great, because that was the bit that I was most worried that if we couldn't make them work, there's a whole lot of back-end automation. So as you can probably guess now, now we're starting to move into the right. We've identified the things that don't work. We've identified the new services that we need to plug in. We've started to figure out what it is we need to do to change the application to run effectively in the cloud. So now we're into modification. Now we actually start formally modifying and changing things. And then you realize that once you started this marble rolling down the hill, it's not a marble, it's a snowball, and it's getting bigger, and things are happening that you weren't necessarily expecting. So the first thing we did was we updated all our dependencies. By crikey, that was interesting. Um, we updated the Redis NuGet packages and suddenly couldn't talk to on-prem Redis. Because <laughs> we thought, well, that should be you know, backwards compat, right? But no, the Windows version of Redis we were using was so old, it didn't do TLS apart from anything else. Um, so 
some unexpected things happened. Good job we're working in a branch, right? Good job we keep backwards testing with all of this because we need to be able to continue to deploy on-prem until we're ready. We also started looking at whether we could replace Signal R, which we're running inside our application, with the Azure service, because that might allow us to simplify some of our code. It might allow us to um, get away from having to host it. it. Might allow us to interact a bit more easily with Front Door. And then the biggest, the two biggest things that we've we've been doing. The project itself was. It's actually a couple of Windows solutions, but they sort of share projects. So everything was solutions and projects, and everything got built at once. So we got a, a shared component architecture, but we had one big monolithic build. And the most useful investment in time, it turns out, of everything we did was saying, you know what, we're going to move from monolithic build to NuGet packages. So we took all of those projects out of the main solution. In fact, we actually pulled the code into other repos. And we built build pipelines that would compile all of those, and we built our own NuGet packages. Now, that gave us some tangible benefits on its own for the project, because now we're not building as much, so the build time went down significantly. It also means now that we can rev those individual components at different paces, and it means we've removed some risk, because a change in one thing no longer ripples through and impacts everything immediately. So you can start to do um, engineering change control. We will rev this package over here, but the engineers of the main solution will choose at what point they are comfortable updating to the latest version of the NuGet package. And because we're in NuGet, things like Azure Functions and cloud services become easier because they know and they understand NuGet. And the way we package things means that we can have just the stuff we need for the component for which we need it to then deploy to the cloud. The other thing we know we need to do and I'll be honest, we are kind of shy about this one, is we are a .NET Framework project. Um, we've, we're running now .NET 4.8. We know we're going to need to move to .NET 6. But that in itself is going to be a challenge. Because we have an Android app, which is written in Xamarin. And we have an awful lot of shared components, which are written in .NET standard. .NET Standard 2. And now we've got a bit of a sliding block puzzle, which is going to be interesting to tackle because we can't move from .NET Standard 2 to 2.1 without breaking the Android stuff. But if we want to move to .NET 6, we need to move to 2.1. So again, we're trying to look at how we can continue to break the application down and separate things out and try and remove those tight couplings so we can, we can manage and change better. So on to operation, running it in the cloud. This one is where I see most of my customers get caught out, um, partly because of the skills and experience of the people they've got, and partly because of the emotional baggage, so we say, of how we've always dealt with software which we write and run on-prem, which has a relatively infrequent update cycle. So the first part of this, to a very large extent, is give everybody a hug. A lot of resistance to cloud, you will find, is through fear. Fear that my skills are not going to be useful anymore. Fear that I've got this huge hill to climb, right, of skills and knowledge of how we run stuff in the cloud. But actually, cloud isn't that scary, particularly in the scenario that we're talking about for this particular product, 
because in order to meet the security requirements, I have to run in a virtual network, which means networking. Networking, that things devs hate and don't understand. And IT pros go, ooh, all right then. So first of all, I've got to get my developers on board and I've got to teach them. But secondly, I can bring all the IT pros that have been operating this product for seven years in and I can get them actually, ironically, to do the skills transfer to the people who need to know stuff, whilst at the same time proving to those IT pros, proving to the customer who's not used to managing and running cloud that actually it's not scary and it will work and all of those old skills are still valid and valuable. And the amount of stuff you've got to learn is not that horrific. But if you're going to do this successfully, you've got to do it properly. I always joke that if you want to, to adopt DevOps in an organization, it is not necessary to adopt cloud. But if you're going to adopt cloud in your organization, it is necessary to adopt DevOps. Because the principles of DevOps that push towards better communication, better automation, shifting everything left, will help you immeasurably as you migrate stuff. Because we want this reliable, repeatable process, right? Because we're literally rebuilding the plane while we're in flight. So I want to make sure that at least deployment and operation is something that I know what's happening and I know what's going on. But you also need to teach people not to panic because cloud can be cruel and you can deploy stuff and it can be a complete black hole until you realize which buttons to turn on to get the telemetry out to see some of the diagnostics. There's an awful lot of, oh my God, what's going on? How do we find out at the start? So you need to help people not to panic. You need to help people learn the diagnostic skills. You've got to help people learn things like App Insights and how to write Kusto queries and all that kind of stuff. That will really help you. So, interestingly, I sort of built this as a story with that. Hey, you know, we've got this really exciting thing. We've got this product. We're going to move it to the cloud. It's going to be great. Um, this entire session started a year ago, I think, maybe two. Um, many moons ago at my first Igloo Conf, Zachary created this WhatsApp channel, right, so the speakers could talk. And that WhatsApp channel has remained, because we're all friends. So if I get a problem, I post in that WhatsApp channel. And I was posting questions because I was trying to figure out issues with front door. And somebody said, hey, Rick, that'll make a really interesting conference session. And I went, you know what? It would. Two years later, we get to the point where I'm actually going to try and deliver this. And we're, we're nearing the point, finally, after customer move the goalpost, where we should be running in production in the cloud, except we're not. <laughs> which, which sort of deflates the happy ending, right? <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about moving an app to the cloud, except we're not going to move it to the cloud. The customer decided they didn't want to move to the cloud in the end. They looked at it and they just weren't that happy that they were going to be able to operate it. But interestingly, they did decide that there were benefits in the cloud and they've accepted that we're on a journey. So all the work I did was still useful. All the work we did in changing things is still actually being deployed because we are running hybrid. We are now using Service Bus in Azure. We are now using Redis in Azure. We're running App Insights Telemetry live on the product. We're looking at putting Azure Storage in. We're looking at pulling in more cloud services because it will help us increase the pace of change. And the customer knows that they're on a journey. They've just taken the foot off the accelerator a little bit. And that's OK. And as it turns out, for this session, it's a good learning, right? There is nothing wrong with saying, actually, we've decided we're not going to rush into the cloud. All of the stuff I've been talking about for the past half an hour, 40 minutes is still perfectly valid. All of those techniques of trying and testing, all of the skills you will learn can only ever be useful, even if it takes longer to get where you thought you were going. And that's fine. 
So I said we learned a bunch of stuff. The first thing I learned is that actually, thank God, I was right. All of that time I've been banging on about if you are building a new application now for your customers that's going to run on-prem, architect it with cloud in mind because the chances are it is going to move to the cloud, just not right now. It turns out that is really good advice. Building our application as a connected set of components backed by service bus um, with separate caching, separate data tiers, all of that meant that actually it was really straightforward in terms of how we would plan our cloud migration. And it was also good for helping us identify clearly what work was going to be needed and what was more important than others to be able to get us into the cloud. But I was overconfident because the trouble is I always forget that cloud is a moving vehicle and it's going quite quick. And you might think you're in the right place at the start, but then it turns out that the cloud's over here. And the things you thought you were going to use have changed. And actually, that is one of the most important things to think about when you move to the cloud. Cloud is for life, not for Christmas. When you move your app to the cloud, it is unlike an on-prem migration. On-prem is easy, right? SQL 2012 is defunct. We are going to move to SQL 2016. We will do the necessary work and upgrades to update our components. And then we can be fairly confident that the customer is going to run that until its last dying breath. The cloud, when our app is in the cloud, it's like having a puppy. You've got to pay attention. You've got to keep looking at the cloud and look at how it is changing and how that is continually impacting your product. Just look at Azure Functions as an example. We're now on version 4 of the runtime, I think. Because every time somebody brings out a new version of .NET, they have to stick a new runtime version on. And .NET itself is no longer this you know, never-ending long Microsoft stream of support. It's got like a two-year life cycle. So now we have tasks that we never used to where we have to have people in our team paying attention to what's changing and what's coming and what the support roadmaps are and all of that. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in a situation where stuff starts to degrade and now you're trying to run to catch up. Now you've got development effort that you weren't prepared for, you weren't expecting, you hadn't planned, and that is a problem. And if, if you take one thing away from this session, it's that you should all go away right now and wire some kind of telemetry service into your application if you do not have it. Logging is great, but it tells you what happened and it doesn't give you the full picture of what was going on at the time. I don't really care what telemetry provider you use. Pick one, instrument the code, because it doesn't take very long to do, and start looking at that telemetry, because actually it'll help you support the application running in production even on-prem. And it's the single biggest change you can make and the single biggest benefit you can give to everybody. And then after telemetry, the team is the second most important piece of advice. Making sure people are comfortable with the changes that are coming. Making sure you explain to people that all of those skills that they've built up over 30 years of working. I'm, I'm grey, I've been around for a while. But I started with IPX networks and netware and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of the stuff I used to do is still relevant now. The concepts haven't changed. It's just somebody keeps scratching the paint off and, and changing the colour. You know, there's so much stuff in the cloud that demands the skills from the past. So you are not obsolete. You know, there is genuine value in old timers like me because we can say, ah, hang on a minute, yeah, firewalls and, and security and trying to analyze packet flow and figure out what's going on with um, Wireshark and, and proxies and all that kind of stuff. 
that's a useful skill. And you tend to find that actually that's more of an IT pro skill than dev skill, which means we can share and we can teach and we can help each other. And once again, I've come to, you know, I said I wasn't going to rant in this session and I wasn't going to preach. And I've just sort of stood here and gone, you know, all hail the church of the great cloud migration. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that over the past sort of 50 minutes or so, I've given you a, a, a bit of insight, a good picture of, of what we did. Um, and I am hoping that for the next 10 minutes, you're going to regale me with interesting and exciting questions. So I will say thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Zach, for having me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. So, they always say, re repeat the question, right? The question was a simple one. Sack said, are you going to admit that you were wrong to begin with? Yes, I was completely wrong to begin with. Um, it's, actually, that's an important thing to get across. Thank you. It's okay to be wrong. You know, because cloud is a fast moving thing, but at least we tried. And as it turns out, because we tried, whilst we missed the target, we didn't miss by much. So I didn't hit sack, but you know, Magnus is lying in a pool of blood now. So I was, I was in the right area. <laughs> left a bit, left a bit, right a bit, fire. Um, we, we, we did spend a lot of time when we first architected the product looking at what was best practice of the time and what were the components at the time that we knew could run in the cloud. And we, we adopted deliberately the technologies we did because we thought they would have a good lifespan. We thought that it would reduce our effort. And yeah, we, we weren't right, correct, but we were close. And had we not done that, it would have been harder. And we would have been in that horrible situation of put it in containers and move it that way. Again, to repeat the question, Sack just said, if the customer had got Zur to do it, it would have gone right first time. Is that, that, that right, Sack? Um, no, he, he's right, though. I mean, um, what he actually said was, look, even if you hire an expert, and the expert knows what he's doing, and I like to think I know what I'm doing, um, they can still be off the mark, but they will, they will point you in the right direction, which is good and is is useful and is helpful. Magnus, you get your hand up. Yeah. The, whole, the whole scenario here with the, with the you win some or you learn some, you kind of fall into the learn some category here. Yeah. Um, why in the end, if you could elaborate just a little bit, why in the end did the um, customer back off, decide to back off? And, and also, which other learnings, like with automation or infrastructure as code and stuff, did you actually pick up and give to the customer that they are now using, despite not going to actually this thing. Okay, so what Magnus just asked for the audience at home was, of, of the learnings, what did we learn that, that has actually sort of made it into production, if you like, has helped the customer? And could I elaborate a bit on, on why the customer decided not to, to move in the end? Um, so that the simple answer to the first one was actually, it turns out they had too much on. Um, 
the teams that we work with at this customer are great. They're really, really talented people, but they only have so much bandwidth. And over the past couple of years, they've had lots and lots of projects. We thought that because there was an infrastructure replacement project going on, that this was the perfect time. And by moving to the cloud, we would help them because we'd take that off their plate. As it turns out, the infrastructure replacement has to happen because a significant portion of their estate cannot be moved to the cloud. So, in truth, we weren't taking something off their plate. We were putting something completely new and unknown and potentially scary onto their plate, and we hadn't realized that. And it did take a while for the customer to actually put their hand up and go, actually, you know what? We've changed our mind. We think this is going to be the wrong choice. But all the work that we did, I said there were some benefits, right? All the work we did in um, componentizing the product, ready to move it to the cloud, that has massively improved the product on-prem. Our build times are quicker. Our components change at different paces. Our overall quality is up. The amount of unit tests is up because you know if we're in the code and moving stuff around, we'll 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 improve it. Um, we've got a much better picture because of that telemetry of how our app runs in production, and because we've added certain components in that have to run in the cloud. We have started the customer on a journey, and they've been learning about how to solve problems like how do we give secure access to the services that are running in Azure right now, right? So Service Bus, Redis, App Insights are in Azure now because they have to be, because no matter how much I begged, Clemens would not let me have Service Bus on-prem. <laughs> um, that's really helped them. And that infrastructure as code that I built, that's what we use to deploy the components that are in the cloud. And that means the customer's also being exposed to those technologies and they're learning them and now they're on the journey with us. And actually I think that has been invaluable. Um, we've learned as a customer supplier pair to be better at communication. Um, you know that whole you sort of notice when your friends are struggling? We've learned to understand more and pick up when, when they are under pressure and under load and, and you know we don't, we don't hassle them as much. So I think everybody got a lot out of the project. And like I say, we are still on a journey. So even though we're not in the cloud now, we are going to move more and more stuff to the cloud as their workload drops and their confidence increases. Any questions from not speakers? And not Sack, because he's picking on me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, on the little bit more technical side, um, how would you approach, or how will you approach now um, the selection between Azure Control and Application Gateway? You mentioned that both. Uh, Ooh, so the question is, how will I approach the selection and choice between Front Door and App Gateway? The answer to that's easy. I never considered App Gateway. Um, <laughs> And you're going to go, why? Why, Rick, did you not consider App Gateway? Um, apart from the fact I just think Front Door's easier, I mean, actually, fundamentally, it kind of comes down to that, right? Front Door is just easier. Um, it's a global service. I don't need to worry about it. I don't have to think about how I plumb it into my, um, my virtual network, how I'm going to... Yes, I've got to configure it, but it's, it's there. You know, it's a ring zero service. It's always going to be there. Putting a private link service into the virtual network so that it can reach in and talk to the stuff in the bubble was incredibly simple. And I don't have to worry about um, you know, App Gateway deploying a bunch of VMs that I need to put somewhere. And is it in my VNet or a different VNet? And is that peered? And have I got enough IP addresses on the sub? All of that kind of stuff. It's, it's just easier. But also, and this is worth calling out, because I've done exactly the same for, for Black Marble, we have one front door, and it's there. And we can plug other services into that front door, 
because that's what it's designed to do. So, you know, Black Marble has our corporate front door and all of our internal services are plugged into that. Whereas App Gateway is more of a, if I've got one application, I've got one App Gateway in that app's infrastructure, right? And my other application has another App Gateway. And now I've got two and the things are breeding and I've got to look after them. And so, yeah, frankly, front door for me is a really easy choice. Okay, Sack, now you can ask the question. Well, no, I, I was just thinking if, if in your opinion, uh, when, you, when your customer is postponing the transition cloud because of the other workloads they have, are they prioritizing correctly? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Do I think my customer is prioritizing correctly because they've pushed back their cloud adoption? Uh, um, So, I think it, it, it's horse trading, right? Them choosing not to move this application to the cloud slows down the roadmap for this application. It will stop us doing some of the updates and new features that we had on our roadmap as quickly as we could. And because of what this application is used for, that does have an impact. But the worst thing you can do as an organization is try to push ahead with a project which is that final straw. It's the, it's the thing that you, you know, you can't keep all the balls in the air at the time. And suddenly, you know, this is the ball that is the, 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 the most difficult shape. It's the different weight to everything else because it's new to them. So I think it was the right choice for them because they looked at it very sensibly in terms of value and risk. And actually, those two words are the most important things when you're looking at any technology project and any cloud migration. It's not about the technology, right? The technology is not actually difficult. If I need my devs to learn Go, they'll go and learn Go. If I need to skill up on new components, I can do that. But we should not even be considering the project unless it brings value to the customer and reduces their risk. If it's the opposite, you shouldn't even start. And in truth, the whole of the approach that I spent nearly an hour talking about comes down to those things. We tried to minimize the risk by doing small things, by making sure we understood how the application worked and put it in the cloud. And we tried to maximize value by making small changes that gave tangible benefits. People think I'd sort of pump primed you with those questions, apart from the ones where I admit that I'm not as good as you. You're better. All right. Thank you, Rick. Thank you.